So welcome everyone uh, to the Victorian AES seminar for November. This is the last seminar for, for the year uh, as put on by the Victorian uh, Regional Network. And uh, today's session is all about evaluator career pathways. Um, the ambition behind today's seminar is to talk about all things careers, given the evaluation field has somewhat expanded, I think, in number and diversity of roles over recent years. And there are opportunities for new entrants, mid-career and more senior evaluators um, that are actually quite diverse. And today's session is a chance to hear from a fairly broad panel about their journeys and also some of the things that they've learned along the way, some of the barriers they've encountered and um, um, yeah, some of the lessons that they've taken from those journeys. So. It's not a, a full um, suite of stories because everyone has their own, uh, but we will have an insight into a few people's uh, journeys through tonight's session. So I'm Charlie Tullock from Policy Performance. Um, I'd like to start tonight's session by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. And I'm on Boon on Country in Victoria. Um, and um, acknowledge all the countries that you're all meeting from as well today and pay respects to past, present and emerging leaders. All right, so um, the PowerPoint slides should be up. And I guess the first, the first thing really to do there is to introduce today's panel because they'll be really driving today's session. I'm purely the facilitator. Uh, so the, the panelists today, we have Leanne Maloney from Clear Horizon, uh, Ruth Aston from University of Melbourne, Farida Fleming from Asai. Ellie McDonald from the Department of Premier and Cabinet, Brad Asprey from ARTD, and Squirrel Main uh, may be on the call uh, at this point or maybe calling in shortly from the Ian Potter Foundation. So we've got a bit of a mix of consultants, um, government, uh, philanthropic sector, and academia on the call. So the idea here is to get a broad picture of experiences and what, what the differences are between different sectors that you, you might find yourself working in as an evaluator. So the uh, broad agenda is there's a few questions that we'll talk through as a group. So first of all, a quick, a quick introduction to, to panelists and then talking a little bit about some of the barriers and challenges in the field of evaluation. So some of the tough things that people have encountered during their career and some of the barriers that have been overcome in becoming an evaluator, I suppose. And also we'll look at a day in the life of an evaluator. It might be your current role or it might be a past role and the challenges are just a little bit different based on the setting that you work in so just contextualizing the differences in things that you might run into and challenges issues and and opportunities and great things about different positions that you've been in as an evaluator um, lessons learned and reflections and then some q a so feel free to jump in with q a's as we go we'll stick to a loose structure but if there are really interesting questions and, and things you want to learn more about, then feel free to, to ask. So first thing, uh, let's let's start meeting our panelists. So the first, well, there's my introduction. I should introduce myself. <laughs> um, so I work for policy performance and in the past have worked in other consulting firms. So a large firm, KPMG, medium sized firm, Acel Allen or the Allen Consulting Group. And as a, in a small evaluation team at uh, HLB Manjud, which is actually an accounting firm and also uh, about four or five years in government in the central agency there. And have spent some time on evaluative study, so the Masters of Evaluation, and before starting in government on the Public Policy Masters as well, and then a Bachelor of Arts at the very start. So loosely, that's that's a broad journey. Um, uh, hi, Squirrel, welcome along. Okay. Just launching into some introductions. So um, uh, yeah, so, that's, that's a quick background to me. We won't talk content at this point, but we'll just ask each panelist to introduce their, their journey uh, briefly, and then we'll, we'll get into some of the media discussion. So first of all, uh, Leanne Maloney. Thanks, Charlie. Yeah, I am. Um, um, so as you can see up there, I'm a director of Clear Eyes and a principal consultant. I've been at Clear Eyes for 10 years. Um, and prior to that, a, a different consultancy um, and doing similar things, but focusing very much on the sectors of natural resources and agriculture. And, and nowadays, um, my um, my focus is, is, is very much, I, I suppose, describe myself as a utilisation generalist. I, I practice evaluation, good 
good practice monitoring and evaluation and bringing value to thinking to a very wide range of uh, sectors and different types of programs and strategies and, and organizations and so forth. So not um, sort of stuck in, in one particular sector, if you like, well, stuck's not the right word, but yeah, um, not working just in one sector, although I still do a fair bit in that sector, um, given the uh, importance of um, and, and the programming that's going on around disaster resilience and that sort of thing these days and, and climate change. Um, yeah, I think I think that's that's all for me for an introduction. Okay. Thank you. Yep, that's excellent. So yeah, life of a consultant, pretty broad in, in evaluation. Uh, so Ruth from University of Melbourne. Great, thanks, Charlie. Um, yeah, so as you can probably see from, from that list, started in um, public health research was my background, um, then sort of fell into evaluation and I thought, wow, this can, you can really make a lot of change here. I'm interested in this. So worked mostly in universities um, doing evaluation in universities in health and uh, education for about eight to 10 years. But I've left at several points to try and experience different sectors. So worked at the OECD for a little bit, um, worked at a evaluation consulting firm in, in uh, Melbourne, which is effective change, and also in not-for-profit at MCRI. And I'm also an honorary fellow still there. So sort of playing in academia and of course, consulting and not-for-profit um, sectors, mostly doing health and education related program evaluation. All right, fantastic. So yeah, broad broad suite of experience there. Um, and you're obviously so young still, so that's great. I mean, it just shows, I guess, evaluators can travel a lot of different sectors. Um, so Farida, Thanks, Charlie. Um, I guess I came to evaluation with it through an interest in um, working internationally, so in international development after doing my, um, and that I guess was driven out of an interest, you know, my, my family background, a bicultural family background and wanting to work internationally, um, working first as a, as a teacher and then bringing that interest in education and international um, relations through to uh, work as an evaluator um, in international development projects after working for some of the um, project management companies. Um, and I guess that came out of an interest, you know, working in project management. Um, what you find in international development is that often you're working in projects where the scope's already been developed. And, uh, and it seemed to me that there are only a couple of points in the project cycle in design or then in monitoring or in evaluation where you had a chance to um, connect in with the community and with program implementers to see how things were going and to see if things needed to be changed because oftentimes it might be years after design that you're dealing with um, implementation and implementation issues. So that, that reflective um, cycle uh, which is similar to teaching is what interested me and, and maybe want to pursue this field further. Thanks. Okay, yeah, fantastic. Um, all right, so next uh, we have uh, Ellie McDonald, so working at the Department of Premier and Cabinet in Victoria. Thanks, Charlie. So my sort of introduction to evaluation came from a background in public policy and research. The first positions that I had or, or while I was studying, I was really interested in working in the not-for-profit not sector in research and improving public policy. Uh, and I was first introduced to evaluation when I was uh, at Oxfam. I was working as an as a intern and officer there, uh, looking at an ME framework for women's leadership. And I found the concepts of, uh, that, that I learned there really, really fascinating. And, and I think uh, really showed the importance of driving uh, evidence-based programming or evidence-based policy and sort of saw, saw a link in my studies as well. Uh, and, and entered into government um, in the Department of Health and Human Services in a really exciting team that was uh, started up as one of uh, the first sort of in internal consultancies to build evaluation capacity in-house in government. And uh, I was exposed to undertaking evaluations, but also uh, capacity building training and learned a lot about project management and stakeholder relationships in that team. Uh, but I suppose also my background, I studied international relations, so I was always really interested in working overseas. So 
that experience from government in Victoria took me over to Timor-Leste recently. And I was working in monitoring and evaluation in another, in actually the government there in the Secretary of State for Equality and Inclusion. So it was around um, looking at gender equality programs and uh, developing m &E systems to understand the outcomes of those programs for women and communities. And more recently, I'm in a Department of Primary and Cabinet. It's, it's still focused on evaluation, but uh, a lot of the, the focus is on outcomes and uh, how do we support program teams to, uh, to measure against high level outcomes frameworks for whole of Victorian government. Okay, yeah, again, a, quite a broad, broad experience there in a, you know, several years of a, a, an evolving career and interesting on looking at the list that evaluation was already just a few jobs in and then all of a sudden evaluation came along and things have, I guess, narrowed a little bit in, in that space. Um, so Brad Asprey um, is a director at ARTD Consultants um, and backed by popular demand. So Brad spoke at the November uh, 2019 end of year seminar. So welcome back, Brad. Thanks. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks everyone for coming along. Um, listen, listen to us be very self-indulgent tonight about our, about our careers. I think um, we're, we've got one person left, but you'll see that the pathways into evaluation are all really diverse. And you'll hear most people um, often use the phrase accidental evaluator, which I think Gene King, uh, evaluation theorist first used. So I was probably doing evaluation before I realized I was doing it. Um, and, you know, was quite lucky to have had um, a number of mentors who were, who were one of the first people to start doing evaluation in Australia from, you know, from when it sort of started to get off the ground in the 1980s. Um, I came into evaluation via a background in criminal justice and criminology. Um, so hence the, I didn't put this slide together. I don't know if I got that listed on my LinkedIn, Charlie, Community Corrections Officer, Department of Justice. Yeah. That's a blast from the past. Um, that was a fun job during the, during the Kennett era. Um, yeah, I've got, I could tell you a lot of stories about being a community corrections officer, probably more interesting than being an evaluator, but we'll save that for another time. Um, so I, yeah, my um, most of my work has been as an external evaluator and working um, up until two and a half years ago in an academic setting. So um, a lot of what I've been doing is um, training and teaching people how to be evaluators um, while doing evaluations. Um, I guess from our qualifications, yeah, it's pretty pretty diverse. Um, I've got the evaluation thing there, so that's good. I've got some professional training in evaluation, um, and it says PhD in public health, but it was it was really around evaluation methodology. Um, so I guess I'm pretty comfortable calling myself an evaluator, although I don't often say I'm an evaluator because um, people don't get what that is. Um, just the other day, out on my street, there's a guy walking past, wanted to have a chat, and asked me what I did and I said I stupidly said I'm a program evaluator and that the conversation went strangely from then on in um, so yeah we, we live in a an interesting space in terms of being able to define our identity so we'll probably touch on that tonight but um, thanks for the introduction Charlie and I think Squirrel you're next yep, oh. correct. Hi all yeah I well and truly feel like a bit of a wild card here but um Thanks for listening anyway. Uh, yeah, so my first evaluation job ever was a summer internship from uni. Uh, I was in the US Department of Education, sorry, New Zealand born, American education and accent, apologies in advance. Um, and um, they had me evaluate the Goals 2000 Education Act for all of Congress with absolutely no training experience or even sense of what the word evaluation was, I think it was 17. Um, I did an abominable job, but it, you know, it was a good deep ending. Um, and then I decided politics in Washington DC were not for me. So I uh, switched, had a double major in education, became a primary school teacher, was very happy with that. Um, was out in California, wanted to train to be a principal. This shows my age a bit. This is back when applications were tick formed. Tick the boxes, was lucky enough, got into Stanford, but um, Stanford Perspective Principles Hope Program and Policy Analysis and Evaluation Program are alphabetically next to each other. And I found myself on day one in a lecture by David Fetterman. Um, so there I was in the policy analysis and evaluation stream. And I, I went and checked with the registrar. And in fact, that's what I had signed up for. 
So, um, so I had an amazing education as an evaluator, which was sort of maybe opposite and different to everyone else, but um, absolutely no intention of being one. <laughs> so went back, uh, became a lead teacher, did a bit of principal things, um, worked at Outward Bound as a kayak instructor after that, um, picked up a PhD in beginning teacher support, really passionate about education reform. Um, and then finished my contract in New Zealand at Outward Bound School and decided to move to um, Melbourne, uh, was broke, unemployed. This was after the Christchurch earthquake. So basically a, an earthquake escape <laughs> and um, um, went and begged my PhD supervisor, John Hattie, for a job, any job, and got one um, working on a longitudinal study called E for Kids, which gave me a bit of experience in things like SPSS and all that, but again, not evaluation. Um, but then from all of that, a bit of Fetterman and a bit of the um, E for Kids study was it was able to then um, I finished my contract with Unimail, picked up another one or two, and then um, got a research officer at Brotherhood. So Ellie, I don't know if our paths crossed at the same time or not. There you go. And then uh, while I was working at the Brotherhood, um, a guy named Alberto, who was one of our funders, just tapped on my shoulder and said, hey, do you want this random job? And it's a long story short, but I was taking impro comedy and thought I'd say yes, because that's one of the homework assignments they give you in, in impro, say yes to everything, say yes to all offers. So I was like, yeah, sure. Anyway, long story short, I've been at, um, in Potter now for five years working as the research and evaluation manager. And wow, you know, I've certainly been well immersed in evaluation and very glad that I had the academic grounding, even though um, the practical course was quite windy to get there. Sweet. Thanks, Charlie, for a slide reminding me of what I've done. Yeah, yeah those second, slides, I'll second that. <laughs> yeah, I should say I didn't run them past uh, editing them, but they were drawn from LinkedIn, so public knowledge. And um, thanks for just being hit by your whole career on a page. It's it's quite, quite full on sometimes when you look at that. Um, <clears throat> so that's just a, a quick introduction, I suppose, to the panel um, who are speaking tonight. But really to get into the, some of the more meaty content, we want to start to think about what are the some of the challenges that we face as evaluators and knowing the different sectors and contexts that we work in is probably just a really important uh, feature and factor. So I suppose um, the first question is really about barriers and um, challenges that you might face as an evaluator and some of the sort of testing times and things that you might need to overcome in, in the doing projects or facilitating projects and thinking about whether this field is, is for you. Um, and we will then get into after that a bit of a day in the life, like what are some of the, the things that you need to do? And, and it, that's probably a tough one because a day in the life of an evaluator is a little bit different every day. Like no, nothing's, no two days are the same for, for people in our field. Um, so on the barriers and, and, and challenges thing, I suppose to get the ball rolling from my perspective as a, an evaluation consultant, I think some of the barriers that I've faced have been around um, sort of quite large projects with quite small teams is probably one of the, the more challenging times that you'll face as an evaluator. Um, and that's, that, that's contextualized across the different settings in which you work. So for example, if I just, again, I'll flip back to my slide, but working in a, a small team at HLB Manjud, there was really only four people in our team. So there's not many places you can go for help in that scenario. You're a little bit you've got your projects and you're a little bit stuck with them and if you get more then kind of good for the business but bad for the individual because it's it's really heavy workload and then same sort of scenario at um, a medium-sized firm but with a little bit of extra support and perhaps greater diversity of skills around you so you may be only one of two or three evaluation people who are focused on that field but you have other capable consultants who can play a role in your evaluation project so you, you form these little distinct little teams to do evaluation work. And at the a bigger firm like a, a KPMG, the real advantage there was you've just got this great scale. So there's always some free resource or capability to be able to help on your projects. But then the downside is they probably have never heard the word evaluation, let alone worked on an evaluation, and now they're, they're now part of your team. So you need to quickly upskill someone in what is an evaluation, what, what are we doing here? Um, but as that sort of evaluation project manager or person in the middle of it, there are challenges either way. Like there's challenges if you're in a tiny organization, there's challenges if you're in a big organization with generally more projects to manage and run. 
Um, so I guess that's just one of the things that I kind of look back on over the 10 years. And now I'm a sole evaluator, so sole, sole practice. So there's other issues there where there isn't the scale but and there's not the support, but then there's opportunities to partner. So I think the position that you work from or, or work in is a real defining feature to me about what your workload is going to be and what your daily life as an evaluator uh, will be as well. So that's just a little bit of a, a start to get the ball rolling. Do any panelists want to talk to the barriers and challenges question specifically? Maybe just raise your hand and I'll um, uh, take comments from the group. Who wants to get the ball rolling on that one? What are the, so what are some of the challenges you've faced? So Leanne and then Squirrel. Just on mute there, Leanne. Classic. <laughs> Thanks, Charlie. Yeah, I was just listening to what you said and yeah, the, 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 what you said in, in terms of where I've worked has, has been very similar. I guess um, what, one way of thinking about it from my perspective is the way we come into evaluation. And I think, you know, you think about um, a teacher or a lawyer or a doctor, um, you know, you, you do your undergraduate um, sometimes for many, many years and then you, you pop out and you're a lawyer or a doctor or a teacher and off you go and you start, and of course you get better and better over time and more experience, but you start kind of on day one doing what you, you, know, you plan to do. Um, and evaluation is really different. So, um, you know, last time I looked, there wasn't an undergraduate course and I, 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 I can't imagine someone popping out after doing a, a three-year um, undergraduate straight out of school and be, be having some any real legitimacy or credibility as an evaluator because I think a lot of a lot of what you bring to evaluation is is your life experience and um, your maturity and um, so we my experience and I think it's the experience of quite a few people has been um, learning about evaluation on the job and then you know sometimes even decades after working actually going and thinking about possibly getting a, a professional qualification in evaluation or not, because you just built up a bag of experience over the years. Um, and of course that's changing now, but um, yeah, how we come into evaluation is not usually straight through an undergraduate. It's, um, it's a very, very different experience. And we usually start off in a sector, learning about evaluation in the, a sector, and then possibly staying in that sector or not, moving on and becoming an evaluator who is possibly sector agnostic, which is um, yeah, pretty much you know, who we are at Clear Horizon. Uh, so squirrel. Yeah, I guess um, I think yeah, I agree with Leanne that that experience factor is some of is some uh, something to consider, and I, I strongly encourage anyone wavering on it, go do something else for a bit, like whatever your calling is, teaching, environmental engineering, um, and then pick up and swing back into the evaluation. It, it'll give you just a little bit more street cred. Um, which is a sad thing to say, like, you know, does a public school teacher need to go and be an environmental engineer to get street cred as a school teacher? No, but it's different. It's not yet a professionalized industry. It is a, a cottage industry with a lot of small businesses um, that is aiming towards professionalization. And, you know, the AES was um, deliberating through, you know, do we want level one, two, three, or four, you know, to what degree of professionalization are we aiming for? It's brilliant conversations to be had. So it's not nascent, you know, there's something in this profession that is congealing, but at the same time, it's really tricky to just jump into it if you've done nothing else. Um, and I would say I'm speaking from the other end and this is gonna sound awful, so I'm sorry, but um, in my job, probably I read about an evaluation a day um, and I've done so for about five years. So let's just ballpark a thousand. Let's say I've had some days off. Um, there's some really poor quality evaluations out there. And one of the challenges I find, it's really hard to tell someone that they've done a poor quality evaluation um, when there's not necessarily um, standards or comparisons. So I can think like, oh, you know, out of the last 200 arts evaluations I've read, this one doesn't go so well as the others. Um, and a lot of times it's people with um, less experience in the field or, or uh, you know, are, are newer on. So I, I would encourage people to get an, a mentor or somebody to really overcome that. That the, Rather than seeing it as a barrier, um, my suggestion would be if you have less experience, really try to align yourself with a, an evaluator that you believe in and see what kind of um, mentorship arrangement you could possibly get from them because I think a lot of people might think they're doing good evaluations and they're actually, they're not. 
and it's really hard to say that to someone's face. It's nice and easy enough, vaguely here speaking abstractly, but it's a challenge that I face. And so I'm very much in favor of the professionalization of the industry and the increase in standards so that quite frankly, as a consumer, I'm getting um, good product to read at the end. Don't know if other folks want to speak more to that. Yeah, yeah for Rita. I think um, so there's been quite a few interesting points there. And um, just to branch off in a slightly different direction, I mean, I think I found the challenges, you know, um, over a couple of years um, can sometimes come at that last period where, where you're negotiating with clients around. Um, so you might have had initial findings and agreed on those, done presentations, and like Leanne, I take a utilisation focus, so it's got to be useful for people and engage them in processes all the way through. That's my approach. But even so, I think it's important to recognise the different stakes that people have in evaluation and that sometimes, so, so Squirrel, just to take the other perspective, sometimes, sometimes clients or program staff have their own professional reputations and careers at stake as part of an evaluation process. And so, um, you know, what's important to understand is therefore um, sometimes people's perspective about what's important. You know, if, if some people are more interested on in what's working and what can be built on, especially if their careers and are a part of that. And if others are focused more on what can be improved, you know, that can be an issue of contest, you know. Um, and I think here, I think the profession, so I think just to distinguish between kind of professionalization and accredit credentialism, you know, like I think we're not yet a credential then in, in fact, AES hasn't decided to take that path, but definitely um, trying to be professional. But, but as you say, Squirrel, you know, you need that body of knowledge to, to be able to compare oneself and know where one stands. But still, I think within the profession, there are things that can help us like the competency standards, you know, and I think one of the areas that those competency standards helps us look at is, is this thing about understanding the context and understanding that power and discussion, negotiations of power are part of that. Um, and that with that comes some difficulty sometimes and we have to work our way through that. And in fact, Brad, I think I remember one time I listened to you a couple of years ago and I remembered you saying, look, it's important as an evaluator to think about one's position, whether one is only client focused or thinks of oneself as, as you know, as professionally an evaluator and, and um, it's incumbent then to be, to think about one's own um, integrity and, and um, position, you know, so I think I found that very helpful. Um, so, so I'll throw that into the mix of challenges that, that I've found and how I've tried to negotiate my way through it. So a segue for me then maybe, <laughs> then maybe you, Ali. Um, I, I, in preparing, just I, I jotted down a few challenges, which some relate to some of the things we've been talking about in terms of the concept of evaluation careers, but I think the brief was to talk about barriers and challenges generally, not necessarily about how you come into the field. Um, so I think I listed one, two, three, four, five, six, seven random things that came off the top of my head that all have a really long story behind that um, about half a bottle of wine for each of them. Um, so I'll just read them out and that could, you know, just throw some ideas out there. So when I first, I came into evaluation via, you know, research, often where I, we'll be given funding to do something and we didn't have a client you know it was it was a research grant so um when i first started doing evaluation and there was someone who was paying you to do the job then you become a, like a tradesman you're a plumber you know you're a you're a hired gun in some senses and i found that quite confronting um and it, the first one was probably yeah, a bit of a baptism of fire um it wasn't it, it was very challenging and it just made me start wondering is it all just politics and I'm, and I'm still wondering that. Um, the, the second thing that links to that and what Frida had mentioned was this question around um, utility and validity. So our two meta standards out of, out of another three are uh, being useful and being valid or being credible or being accurate and being technically rigorous, whatever that means in terms of your paradigm. And I've often kind of framed that as, as attention and I kind of sum it up sometimes as saying, you know, getting it right versus getting along. Like I, I don't expect to make friends all the time when I'm doing an evaluation. 
Um, so I think that's important to keep in mind as, as well um, and gels with the politics side of it. Um, you'll probably see an ongoing theme throughout some of my quotes. The, se the second challenge, uh, sorry, the third challenge is I've noticed this increasing push towards the sound bite glossy infographic evaluation. And maybe I'm seeing more of that now because I'm, um, you know, more interested in what competitors are doing because I'm working in a commercial space as opposed to an academic space. And I, I just, I want to say to people that I, you know, hope against all possible hope, but there's still a place for the thoughtful considered report that stands the test of time and can contribute to um, change over the longer term. Um, I think um, in the post -truth, truth and thankfully post Trump world now, we're still confronting problems around the devaluing of evidence. Um, and that I can see that more and more in evaluations that I'm doing. Um, and, you know, where if anyone's kind of interested in this notion of, you know, society fragmenting a little bit, then there's a recent article from someone I'm a huge fan of, Ernie House, who's written an article on um, evaluation of fragmented society that's just published in the journal of multidisciplinary evaluation. And so we're seeing the context in which we're doing evaluation changing quite a lot. And that impacts on us when, you know, we try to follow, you know, good practice in terms of methods, but we're competing against this sort of post-truth anti-science sometimes mentality. Um, I, I think I've seen in the 20 years I've been doing evaluation, increasing democratization of evaluation. And I'm a huge fan of that to a point. Um, because it does address that elitism of the past. So in the 60s, when people started doing evaluations, it was a very elitist profession and you had a lot of academics crawling out of ivory towers to evaluate war and poverty programs. Um, but I'll just caution that although everyone can do evaluation, not everyone can do evaluation well. So like Squirrel, I am a fan of, of um, increasing the push towards professionalization because anyone can put up a shingle and call themselves an evaluator. Um, the sixth one, was something I um, was very passionate about, which is the lack of appreciation for the knowledge and theory base of the discipline. And so while I'm, I think Leanne's point about learning on the job is really important, I think there also needs to be that feedback loop. And it doesn't matter whether you start as a practitioner and because we are a very practice-based profession and then connect back with the theory or we start with the theory and then go into the practice, it's, it's the constant um, it's like a yin and a yang, and they should be interacting throughout your career the whole time. Um, and it doesn't matter which point you come into it. Um, and the last one, the last challenge um, is, I've, I've labelled it turf wars and status anxiety. Um, the turf wars bit is, it's becoming increasingly acutely aware to me that, um, that we still suffer from the fact that there's a lot of other people who are doing stuff like what we do. Um, and are getting jobs, yet they know nothing about the field of evaluation. That's because the people who are buying the products don't either. So we have the, you know, the rise of behavioral insights and um, data science and data analytics. And um, it, it just worries me a little bit because we can't position ourselves as offering a unique thing above and beyond those professions, which are complementary, but they're not evaluation. Um, so that's just, uh, maybe that stimulates some other discussion from um, from you, Ali, or Ruth? Yeah, I don't know if you want to share something, Ali. I was uh, just going to tack on that. I, I That was one of my um, <laughs> challenges, actually, um, Brad. I, I realised how much of the work that I do when I was reflecting back on it today is actually about advocacy for the discipline. And I'm not sure if that's because I work in the academic space, but it was true when I was in consulting as well. Like, what is evaluation and then why are we not research? Are we research or are we evaluation? So I, I think that was, for me, earlier when I began an evaluation, it was particularly hard to do. It's easier as I've gotten older. And I must admit, Squirrel and Leanne, your, your comments about um, the evaluator being seen as someone who can draw on life experience and have experience, I definitely... I definitely felt that when I began doing an evaluation, which I was always as part of a team, but I think, I don't know if there are many people on the call. I've seen a lot of students' names here. So some of you may be, may be um, new and perhaps beginning your careers in evaluation. Um, I, I think that, that that's still a challenge for, for a, a younger or an early career evaluator to be able to communicate one's skill 
um, one's disciplinary skill is, is very important because when I began, a lot of people were much more interested in hearing about subject matter expertise, like, okay, so what can you contribute here? And perhaps not so interested in uh, critical thinking skills, evaluative thinking skills. But I have seen that change immensely in the last couple of years and much more appreciation for capacity building. And, and I don't know, Brad, if that's us getting confused and other people coming into the field of evaluation more and more. But I do think it's made it a little bit easier to, to communicate what we can bring to the table, particularly as external evaluators. Um, the, other, the other thing I just wanted to bring to the fore, come, I'm supposed to be, I think, the academic evaluator panelist, so I just wanted to bring to the fore one, one barrier that might be more appropriate to, to someone working in an academic setting. Um, a lot of the time when, when we're asked to do an external evaluation, we're called an academic evaluator. And I remember asking a consultant, what, what on earth do you mean by that? Um, and, and as Brad was sort of intimating, um, what it, the common uh, definition I've experienced is someone who has great command of theory and, uh, and kind of knowledge foundations of the discipline. And what I would urge everybody, and I'm sure other panelists would agree, is that doesn't really have anything to do with academia. Anyone can can hold that that background. So um, that's just a perspective I wanted to share, and it's something I try and uh, not dispel, but communicate when I'm asked that question, because I think it doesn't have to be, as Brad sort of intimated, the the ivory tower in theory doesn't have to only sit within that that setting. I think there have been so many advances by evaluation practitioners and contributions to theory, and I can see that growing and growing and growing. So. Um, that's something that I try and communicate regularly, but as somebody who does work in an academic setting, often I am asked to comment on a theoretical integrity of an approach or validate someone's approach. Someone asked me to do that today. Can you validate my evaluation framework? So that, that's um, a lot of the jobs that we get, which can be challenging for, for a person new to the evaluation to have the confidence to be able to say, you know, this is a good approach or not and be able to back it up. So yeah, that's that sounds a lot like yeah, Brad's what Brad was mentioning about the validity of research designs and being the critique of that. And yeah, in consulting space, it's a bit the same. So as the evaluator in a big organisation, every time there's a project that's called an evaluation, you're involved and you need to help shape this robust and rigorous and reliable uh, consulting method. Which is, on the one hand, it's a great opportunity to have an involvement, but does add a little bit of an extra burden in a trying to get the project's done and, and budget them appropriately rather than going down the line on every component that you'd love to have in an, every evaluation but may not be feasible. Um, but yeah, then on the flip side, coming up with good methods that will also win work and keep the business um, solvent. So uh, Ellie, uh, any yeah. comments about your challenges and barriers and things that you've encountered throughout your time in evaluation? Thanks, Charlie. And I just wanted to touch on Ruth's point. I think um, when I was in working in DHHS, which was a few years ago now, but there was a positive, uh, positive and very strong focus on theory and bringing the theory into evaluation. So that is, I think, slowly moving into government. It's not definitely not perfect and I'm probably not at the standards of Melbourne University, but it's very much a focus, I think. Uh, it's, it's seen as important. Uh, within internal evaluation in government. But I suppose just to also uh, respond to the conversation around early evaluators, I myself am an early evaluator and I think I wouldn't discourage people who are say coming out of their studies and interested in this field to not move into, uh, not move into the area. There's a lot of places within government, I think there's a huge investment from different secretaries across different, different departments, as well as Daniel, Daniel Andrews, to really push uh, evidence-based policy and evaluation. So within a lot of the line departments like uh, DHHS, Department of Education, um, Department of Justice, uh, I think all of them actually have an evaluation, an internal evaluation team with uh, li uh, varying investments, but I know Department of Education is really building their evaluation team uh, and starting up next year. So I think from my perspective, 
being in a team and being surrounded by really experienced technical experts was a really valuable uh, experience for me, learning the ropes and seeing, as Farida mentioned, there's there's a whole range of different components of evaluation from um, stakeholder engagement to project management to, to qualitative and quantitative data analysis and, and methodology and design. There's just so many different aspects of it, I think, and and um, no one can be great at all of them. And I think being in a really diverse and dynamic team can help you find your place in the field and and learn the ropes at, and make sure that you're sort of, uh, there is that quality because you've got that experience behind you from, from your team. Uh, but in terms of challenges, I wanted to be, I wanted to just touch on uh, my experience in Timor. These are two just really, really different challenges that I think uh, are still relevant in Australia, but in international development, some of the really basic things like um, bringing stakeholders, bringing the right stakeholders together can be a real challenge, really identifying them, but also in terms of logistics, a lot of the stakeholders are um, five hours drive away or, you know, uh, um, almost a day sometimes away. So how do we engage with them where there's uh, limited internet connection and, and email capacity and I suppose that comes into the ability to do data collection and uh, no, no data is ever perfect. So uh, I guess evaluation, you really want to find a, a range of different data sources. But when that's not feasible, I think that's a real challenge in the international development sector uh, to really find the right approach and also the right approach for, for the community and, and the audience that you're trying to tailor uh, that evaluation to. And I think also within government, within the Victorian government, that's a challenge uh, when writing reports, there's a range of different audiences that want to hear a different story and they've all got investment in this evaluation, they're contributing in some way. So how do you uh, deliver a report that will satisfy a range of different audiences? Uh, and lastly, the last one I had down was just the, the constant churn um, and very quick cycle of uh, political decision making and election commitments and investment and often uh, in government while there's really great work being done within evaluation and, and trying to feed that back through recommendations to support evidence-based policy. Uh, a lot of political decisions are made uh, before the evaluation is ready or um, uh, uh, not within the time frame. So I suppose there was a lot of discussion uh, during the recent AES uh, conference online about the sort of need for more quicker evaluation. And there's sort of, I, I suppose, a few different ways to get around it, but that also compromises the quality. So yeah, I think they're just a range of different challenges I've seen in my uh, early career. All right, fantastic. Does that spark any other thoughts in panelists, any of the broad discussion there? So early speakers who wanted to pick up on anything or if not, we'll, we'll jump on to a day in the life of an evaluator. So yeah, we were hoping that on this call, there might be some people who are either thinking about moving into evaluation or thinking, well, I've got all these skills that I've developed through my personal interests and study background and past jobs and things. Like if I was to do evaluation, where should I start? Should I be looking at government jobs? Should I be looking at philanthropic? Should I be looking at international development? Should I be trying to get into consulting, like where do I, where's the best place to, for me? And I think what we're hearing here is that we've all kind of gone into areas of evaluation that, um, that interest us, but as much from our personal, um, personal interests as our career interests. So evaluation is not only a job that we turn up to and do, usually the sorts of jobs that we're interested in doing relate to stuff that we've um, done at some level before, or at least we can kind of understand and apply our, our minds to as evaluators across the discipline. Um, but yeah, really the, the, the question about the day in a life, does it change based on the different organizations you've been in? Does it, um, does it, is it, is it fundamentally different sit the day that you'll work in academia versus the day that you work in consulting? Maybe a question there for Brad. Um, I'm interested in a day in, uh, Timor Leste versus a day in DPC, it's probably drastically different. Like, what, what sort of, how does a position or the, our, our, our job in evaluation change what we have to do each day and um, the way that we do it? 
I think a big one's whether you're internal or external. I know that they're blurry boundaries with those roles, but that I've been an internal evaluator, <clears throat> fortunately only once. Um, I find it much easier to criticise from the outside um, than criticise from the inside when your job's on the line. So I think that can change things quite a lot. Um, the setting can change things quite a lot too. Like I think, um, yeah, if you're working in remote locations and yeah, it, it can change like Ali was describing. So I think international development evaluation is really, really challenging because you've got language, travel, security, risk, small budgets, small time frames. Like it, the, the, the environment and the commissioning approach can change it quite a lot. Like how much, like we're all, like evaluation is really interesting because it's um, much harder than research because we've always got time, budget, data, political and other constraints. So we have to manage the best we can and do something that's good enough in that context. So I think it, the setting does dramatically affect um, particularly the role, I think. Mm. And I'd add to that, I think seniority plays a difference in um, what you're doing over time. So when I started, I was focused on data collection, you know, and then I, I'd pass the data to someone else, you know, and then as I advanced, then I was doing more of the analysis and then, and then getting into developing designs or m &E frameworks, um, doing evaluation capacity building, which I really enjoy, you know. So I think um, that's part of difference as well, um, time. And, and what you're asked to do as a function of, of your, your experience. Mm. That really resonates with me, Farida. I know um, that um, you know, these, these discrete tasks that um, you know, someone can take, but they're not expected to have or understand the, the methodology from beginning to end. And um, if you're not really careful about that, especially, um, and I, I imagine it's not just in consulting either, um, um, when you're growing people um, in their roles, um, they can get really, really good at these discrete tasks, but not have an understanding of the whole. And that's a really, obviously, a really, really important thing for, for people to be able to step in and lead their own projects. Um, I had a different experience, even though that's been my that's been my experience of watching others um, come into the organisation. My experience was different in that I was given the um, a nice little cookbook on how to do a performance story report. And, and a training in it. Um, and there was the Australian government was running a bunch a trial and it was paying a, a bunch of consultancies to run a lot of performance story reports across Australia um, under the Natural Heritage Trust um, back in um, 2006, 2007. And so I got this little manual and I'm really good at following instructions. I'm like, cool. And so I did my evaluation and the client was happy with it. And um, there was a lot of support attached to a lot of guidance. And I believed that was what evaluation was evaluation was I had no idea that what I'd done was one form of evaluation and that there are other forms and it took me about two years to realize that this thing that I because I just thought oh, I've got this now I've never been more confident in my life to do an evaluation than I was on my first one um and my, my, so is uh but yeah that 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 maturity and growing from doing these bits to actually doing the whole is, is one of the um the challenges I suppose it's part of your natural career, career progression as well um but so, yeah something to watch out for And so Squirrel, I think it sounds like your day in the life is really quite different to many evaluators. So reading a new evaluation a day is a little bit of a luxury probably for some of I've us. I've got the dream job, man. I'm just, um, <laughs> not that everyone else's job isn't great, but I just like, let me just say, <laughs> I'm on such a good wicket. I keep pinching myself. One day it's going to end, but until then. Um, so we have, I don't know, loosely 240 grantees. My role is, is, you know, threefold, past, present, future, but I, I both work with the current grantees, but I also, am, uh, you know, with, as an external evaluator, as a consumer, as bad cop, as whatever you want to call it, the monitoring beast, um, which sounds awful, but it's led me to things like canoeing in the Tarkine or working with youth at risk in Cairns. So enough evaluation to um, co and, let me back it up and explain. In the database, about 80 of our grantees, we decide, might need help with evaluation. And that's across our fields of arts, environment, community well-being, education. And so what I get to do is meet one-on-one -on -one with those grantees. And um, again, that's the canoeing in the tar kind, youth at risk in cans. Like, it's just, it's fun. I used to get to travel. Now I get to Zoom, a lot of Zooming. Um, but it's cool because I've met most of the people in person already. I am not doing the evaluations, but helping them 
Maybe it's commission an evaluator. Maybe it's making um, an evaluation plan. All the things that Ellie was talking about, those different components of qualitative, quantitative, evaluation, planning, stakeholder engagement. A lot of times nonprofits forget about stakeholder engagement. They're so busy trying to prove they've ticked the boxes, they actually forget to bring in those in-game stakeholders. So it's gentle reminders about that and matchmaking them with evaluators who will be able to help them down the track. Um, yeah, so it's a quick Tinder game for me. Um, unfortunately, it is a bit FIFO, as in I literally fly in and fly out and have a carbon footprint that would make anybody cry, considering I work at a nonprofit that funds evaluation, I mean, environment, but so it goes. Um, I think it does a lot of good, though, because I've often thought about it. Um, uh, I there's, there's two or three things. Um, I have a lot of notes down here, but I, I also, but the flip side is, I get to present to our board and think about our grant making and encourage us to do multi-year grants or grants that are over 100,000 or whatever it is that's going to flip the switch so that we are doing better grant making. And so I'm using the data from the grantees. I need them to do good evaluations so that I can then feed that back to our board and make good decisions about what we're doing in, in the various sectors that we work in. Um, advocacy evaluation is becoming a thing, so having to upskill on that. Um, the philanthropic sector is keen on evaluation, but rather um, <laughs> clueless. Honestly, this is going to be a job sector, people. Like a lot of philanthropics and foundations are going to start hiring evaluators. Um, so, and, and so I am meeting with my peers. So it used to be me alone in a room talking to myself. I did that about twice and then one more. So now there's about seven other people with my role. And it's becoming more and more popular. So it's it's kind of cool because that means I don't have to talk to myself anymore. But it's kind of daunting because people will ask me questions and suddenly I need to have answers. Um, and that's where I rely a lot on people. Like, I'm not afraid to be like, Charlie, Brad, help, man, Clear Horizons, what are you guys doing? Because so-and-so is asking and if I don't want to, I don't want to misrepresent. Um, so yeah, I think there's there's a bit of that which is pretty fun. I do have to read the evaluations. I do have to give feedback. I do have to have really careful conversations with people when evaluations aren't good enough. Um, that's probably the most challenging part of my job. I once read an evaluation where somebody plagiarized data from another cohort of youth. So it was about at-risk youth. They literally ripped the data from another study, rounded it to the nearest five, ran the analyses on that and put it in as their own not even the kids. I'm like, these are at-risk kids. And this is where I get passionate. Like, do that with the kids from Geelong Grammar, but don't you dare do that with at-risk youth. And when I see evaluators doing bad evaluations or mucking up, or even worse in this case, deliberate dishonesty in an evaluation, um, and it's involving, you know, people with disadvantage, I get furious. Um, yeah, so that's part of my job is trying to contain fury and, <laughs> and convey it well. That's probably been more than my four minutes, but that's... Um, I guess that's it's a good idea. So yeah. Squirrel is the gatekeeper of good evaluation in the philanthropic sector. So this is um, what we need to look out for. <laughs> and, yeah. and, uh, and setting your own standards or setting standards, which I think is really Just interesting. Pushing, pushing higher and higher, but also having fun, not losing touch. So having those meeting with the grantees for a day and seeing what they really need and what's happening so that I'm not becoming some weird ivory tower person. Hmm. So like I can see like Brad, I'm not calling you a weird ivory tower person, Brad. It's as a bad subjunctive clause. But um, a lot of them are saying, you know, my government stakeholder wants a two-page infographic, or you know, my in-game stakeholder is looking. So by all means, I encourage you to do the research that Brad's talking about and have that rigor behind your methodology, but be able to code switch. And if you don't have infographic skills, I recommend trying to get a, a rudimentary level of it so that you can have a clear and well-pitched presentation if and when needed. Um, and being able to code switch between the two. And I'll be quiet now. Sounded like a segue to Brad again. Um, but yeah, I, I do want to also hear from Ellie about what life was like in Timor Leste and, and walking in as an evaluator. I'm not sure whether you were the only one or there were others. But Brad, did you want to add before we? Uh, no, I, I don't think we've got time, but I wrote a diary entry for today, but we'll save that for another. <clears throat> I don't write the diary entry, so this is my first chance to do it. So. I'll, I won't I won't read it out, but but um, basically it was I had deal with screaming child in the background, deal with poor data. That was just part of the entry um, for today. 
All right, that's the day in the life. Yeah, deal with screaming child, deal with poor data. Yeah, in that order, presumably. Yeah. Uh, Ellie? Yeah, thanks, Charlie. I'm trying to think of the day in the life um, of an evaluator for Timor Leste. I think, I think the within the government, the government of Timor Leste has very, very limited resources. And one thing I realised going there was that um, uh, the focus was very much more on monitoring and setting up monitoring systems and monitoring, finding, finding data that uh, would be of quality to show uh, progress towards outcomes um, from a monitoring perspective, because there just wasn't the money to, to bring in um, a, whole, a lot of resources. It was very costly to go out to municipalities. Uh, so we were trying to make the most of at field offices within government um, and to support them to develop data collection plans and survey tools to do uh, uh, on paper, in paper form because uh, of the limited internet access. So it was incredibly, incredibly basic um which i found really refreshing i'm I, again i'm a new ev evaluator so i came from uh department of health and human services which was focused a lot on uh different design methodologies different theories which really helped me and build my understanding but going back to basics um and really starting from the beginning was uh something that i found i found really valuable and and i think you can you can definitely do a good job of uh, still finding finding impact in programs by going out and talking to communities and to, uh, collecting stories from women and uh, different community members about what a government program has has um, how it's sort of changed their their financial situation or um, the impact of their uh, family, for example. So I think um, the day in the life in Timor was very incredibly slow, uh, constantly problem solving, constantly, uh, it's very much more focused on relationship building and really understanding um, what would be meaningful to the people that you're working with, uh, what, what is meaningful for them to understand um, the impact of this program so that they can maybe adapt or, or um, deliver recommendations to those higher up to, increase funding or um, redesign a program, but very, yeah, I suppose very basic. Uh, one example is that um, to bring stakeholders together, it was required to basically write, write a letter in, in their local language, Tetan, uh, print those out and find all the different names of the different ministries, which change very, very often and they were hand delivered, but, but they first needed to be signed by my director general. So it could take up to a week to get invitations out to bring stakeholders together. So very, very slow moving, but um, I think incredibly uh, rewarding to, to really see, um, uh, hear the stories of, of how, how government programs are impacting the community, but also how they can be improved. I think all of this makes me think that I mean ultimately we are all the spokespeople for evaluation in our own little in our own little worlds that we are we are all doing evaluation capability building of some sort and advocating for evaluation I guess having done you know been involved in evaluations for years we can all see the value of a good evaluation we know that they're really um, insightful useful important and um, uh, have that change focus and can create change in organizations a good evaluation can can do that. So we can all see the, the positives, but I, I suppose part of our, all of our roles really, no matter what our setting is, is about advocating for evaluation. Um, Ruth, I don't think uh, you had a chance to speak yet about the day in academia and your role. Yeah, sure. I, I suspect it's somewhat similar. Um, I also, Brad, was looking at Outlook Insights. I don't know if anyone's looked at that, but you can get, you know, data about how you spend your day and my collaboration time relative to quiet work is quite alarming, actually. But um, regardless of that, I think what might be of interest to people on, on the session tonight is, um, so academics, doesn't matter what discipline you work in, um, really have to do four things. You have to do research on your discipline. So I have to find 
creative ways and a lot of my day is spent trying to do this find creative ways of finding how I can do research on evaluations that we're currently doing because I don't believe we have yet got grantors who are doing giving out money for doing research on evaluation but we're working on that as part of advocacy so that's that's a big part of what I do so do evaluation and do research on it teach um, in the master's program which a lot of people talk about and supervise evaluation students and then um, a subject that I, I think Again, I don't think it's unique to academia, but uh, is leadership and service. So service to the discipline and leadership of the discipline. So um, being able to talk tonight and, and to work with the committee is, is a component of that, but also um, as part of Melbourne Uni and most other universities, you really have to create international linkages. There's a huge push to try and um, create linkages, particularly in evaluation, because CPE, with, with the only academic centre of evaluation in Australasia. So we, we're trying to build up a larger and larger and larger group of people who, who do evaluation in academia, but also in consultancy who might be interested in doing research on evaluation. So that's a big part of my job as well. And it's also um, some project work. Does that fit into the research bucket or like the, yep. Okay. Yep, yep. So that's the hardest bit to communicate. And I'm sure Brad has got many stories about this and maybe um, for all you may do too, actually, with your work, but communicating that evaluation practice meets the standard of what might be considered doing research at a university. So yeah, majority, majority of academic evaluators, I believe, and sorry, Demi, you might want to comment too, most of us are funded on evaluation projects. Okay. So you kind of have to make the research work in that. So 80% funded on soft money, which means you're just continually looking for the next project and trying to find a common through line for your research, which is quite challenging and interesting at the same time, trying to select projects that might support what you're interested in, but also pay for your job. Yeah, wow. Certainly a pressure, a pressure that's a little bit unique to that setting that others may not. Not, not, not for much longer with all the job cuts in the university sector. Everyone will have to True. have to do what evaluative people who work in it. I mean, there's a lot of academics who do stuff that they don't call evaluation, but it's the same, you know, like, it, it, you know, they're working on applied work, you know, they're getting um, commercial research category, you know, category three and four grants, which are, you know, um, yeah, have a strong evaluative focus. They might not call it that, but yeah, it is a juggle. Um, Ruth's being very modest. She's one of the hardest practicing evaluators as well. So like, she's, I think probably potentially currently doing more projects than I am while teaching and all that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, the being in it, that's why the term academic evaluator doesn't necessarily mean yeah. a lot because um, it's not like you're, you know, just sitting there um, with a, you know, arm patches on and a pipe wandering the library reading interesting random books hmm. yeah about evaluation yeah exactly <laughs> really quite applied yeah. all right excellent um so the last uh, block of questions and we can take some q and a's as well so start thinking of any questions that are, are on your mind but really that the last element is around lessons and reflections about career options and development so i think um um, for me and what I'm just seeing as, a, as an evaluator is there are more roles in evaluation now than I guess they've ever been, um, which I think is a great thing for, for all of us on the call and our profession, that there is variety, like there's choice, there's some, some degree of choice and there are new roles being created. Um, and so it's quite a good time, I think, to, to be, you know, thinking of different options and seeing what's out there and maybe thinking of new challenges or whatever it might be. But um, I suppose the observation from my perspective is that there are a whole range of choices and it was a relatively narrow field, I think, um, when I got into it about 10 years ago, but seeing all of the, the government agencies really driving new positions, a lot of not-for-profits, uh, establishing internal evaluation positions, we're hearing that the philanthropic sector is going that way. I mean, part of this might be market-driven where you know, we're sick of paying the whatever fee for the consultants to come in and tell us stuff that we already knew. We can do this ourselves and capture that knowledge and build capability at the same time. So I think that sort of shift towards internal evaluation positions is something that I'm really noticing quite a lot at the moment. 
Um, so I guess that's a good thing. So for anyone thinking about, is this the field for me? I'd say, give it a go. And um, the skills that you'll learn in evaluation, you can apply to different roles regardless. So you'll learn good, good planning skills, project planning skills, you'll learn consultation skills, how to speak to almost anyone, how to collect and interpret and understand qualitative and quantitative data sets, how to write compelling reports. So the, the skills that you'll develop as an evaluator are transferable. And a lot of, you can take that anywhere. I guess you can take that into, into other sectors would be one of my messages. So um, you'll feel like there's a lot to learn because there's a lot of components that could be thrown into any given evaluation role, but you will take from that things that you can apply in other settings. Any other um, um, comments there or observations about reflections about options and development and where, where people might go in, in the evaluation world? It's a um, random trend, well, not so random, but a trend I'm noticing, um, uh, like with everything else in the Black Lives Matters movement, but just push towards um, equity evaluation. And I think just in general, um, diversity. I would encourage folks to not, like to think of yourself and how you bring a diverse perspective, but to also think of the whole field. So you might be thinking, oh gosh, what should I do? Where, you know, when you land your first job, how can I do this? But um, look around you and who else can you help? Who else, what other person is starting with you in that cohort that um, where, where you can be helping build their skills and capacity because they're bringing a diverse perspective, but maybe they're not, um, I don't know, maybe English isn't their first language. So they're not typing it as fluently as you are, or maybe um, uh, their uh, mathematical statistics skills aren't up to yours. You know, you know, you don't have English as a first language, but you have excellent um, computation and modeling skills help everybody it's a village it takes a village so i really want to encourage you all as a cohort like in drinks afterwards and and, and as you're going through whatever training program or whatever god awful rookie hazing period you have at price water health coopers or whatever else you do like um like you know work with each other but don't just think of yourself and am i good enough and how can i fit and how late can i work tonight but how can i help um um the sector, the diversity, the equity, and build the capabilities all around. Because as a sector, we need to move up, but I also think we need to make sure that um, there are more diverse perspectives. And it's not just diverse perspectives is tokenism on a particular project, but um, there's a real wealth of knowledge. And when you look at when you look at traditional academics, and you can take utilitarianism, and you can take you know you, you, if, if, whether it's Fetterman or Patton or whomever else you're looking at. It's a lot of older white men. So what else can we bring to that tree of knowledge and grow it so that in a hundred years time, there's more, um, the forest has biodiversity. Um, and thanks, I'll shut up. Yeah, I'll just um, build on what Skrull says there about, I think, um, you know, as an evaluator, you also have to kind of determine your own principles and what you're working for. And I think, you know, it, for me, it's not a technical thing. It's a, um, you know, it has to have commitment to it too. I think that's one of the things that makes our work wonderful is that if you have a commitment to social justice, then you can work on programs that are important to you and that you can hopefully make a difference to, you know? So I think that's really important um, to know where you stand and what you're doing it for, you know? Um, and the other thing is, you know, the point you make, uh, Squirrel, is that it takes a village. I think there also is a village, you know? So I think we have to recognize that we're not in this alone. So the professional society is great. You know, the journals are great. Don't just be a member of the Australian Professional Association, join the American one, you know? Um, get the journals, go to the professional learning, read the theorists, you know, all of this just helps us. And, and to Squirrel's point as well, look at other people's work, you know, see what's out there, see where you're good and where you really need to improve, you know, just take the coffee with people, go to have a chat because um, it helps all of us, you know, it really makes us all better. Um, and yeah, yeah. Now that's a good, good point about getting to the seminars. I remember, I think when I, before I was really an evaluator, I'd got dragged along to an AES seminar. And um, the speaker was this, this academic guy who spoke about all these theorists um, from the past and talked in terms of all of their views. Um, it was Brad <laughs> doing the talking and it was completely over my head. And I thought, this is a field I will never understand. I mean, th this is so te technical, complicated and historic and views coming from everywhere. 
um, how could you possibly understand this field? I thought this is not this is not for me. But I guess it's a slow build, and like I guess if I had a chat with Brad now, I'd probably get three quarters of what he was saying, but uh, about the theorists and the background. But it's a little bit of a building blocks approach where it all starts to make more sense the more the more that you do, I suppose. So I'd kind of encourage that stick at it kind of thing. So show the grit, learn just little bits as you go. Some on the job, some theory, some reading, maybe some study, some seminars, um, checking out websites, et cetera. It all, it all helps. I've got just practical advice that I, I wish, to some extent, I wish I followed it to another extent. I'm glad I didn't because uh, I like how I approach evaluation, which is very pragmatic and pluralist, but I've seen people who have done well in their career um, that they've developed um, a niche. I'm thinking particularly um, for those, it doesn't matter whether you're in academia or consulting, but they've, I'm not talking necessarily about inventing an evaluation approach like David Fenneman and being, <clears throat> you know, some old white guru on a tree who talks about empowerment evaluation and hasn't really had a disadvantaged background, which is quite ironic, but, um, you know, the, the, um, the idea of, you know, specialising in something, given that we're a bit of a jack of all trades, master of none, can sometimes be good for your career. So rather than trying to be all things and, and other disciplines specialise, we just haven't really got those, you know, in, within psychology, there's clinical, there's community, there's, you know, within engineering, there's civil, there's mechanical, there's, we don't really have that distinctness yet. We have people who rally around the evaluation gurus and rock stars, but we don't, you know, we don't have these distinct things. So, you know, I, I could foresee situations where people would become specialists in particular sectors. And they, there are people who do that. And so I do a lot of mental health evaluation and they start picking up and snowballing a lot of jobs in that space. There are those who might get well known for using a particular approach. Um, and so they become very well known for being, you know, um, realist evaluators or empowerment evaluators or something, something else. Um, so um, that can be effective. Um, I'm sure that all of you know, um, we're talking about people who may, we don't know who's in the room, we'll hear from people soon. But um, I think the hardest thing is just, um, you know, getting the opportunity. Um, I've, I think nearly every, in the last 20 years, nearly every job I've applied for, I haven't gotten. And all the jobs I've had, they've kind of fell into my hands. Um, so it's really tricky because yeah, I've just, I've written thousands, well, not thousands, but hundreds and hundreds of, you know, applications over my career, even though I've had long stints at different places, but it's been often just the right place, right time. So it's, it's hard to plan for that serendipity. Absolutely. Does um, any of the other panelists have a comment on options, development, opportunities? Ellie? Yeah, I wanted to branch off what Brad was saying. I think as well as specialising in different evaluation methodologies, one, one area that can be useful is to sort of specialise in a particular subject matter area. I think often, even though I, I think our skills are to to be able to transfer our knowledge and learn subject matter expert, uh, sorry, subject matter areas uh, quite, quite quickly, it can be valuable to, for example, um, uh, I've sort of focused a lot on gender equality and, and family violence and out of home care and child protection. And uh, those sorts of areas are all interlinked, but there is a lot of work uh, in the gender equality area. I think a lot of, um, different areas have a gender component. So that is a valuable area. And I think there's a lot of investment in that area in government, uh, but other areas as well, such as climate change and um, uh, yeah, any area really. But I think that could be, that can kind of maybe distinguish you a little bit more, as well as uh, I would suggest engaging in a whole lot of different evaluations. So putting up your hand to engage in a really quantitative focused evaluation. That's not my my background. My background is more qualitative, but I learned a huge amount um, at having to do quantitative evaluations in D, uh, DHHS. And that really helped me in my work in Timor. Uh, I would also suggest maybe moving across sectors. So working uh, in the not-for-profit, understanding that sector as well as government and maybe the private sector, I think that can really help you 
uh, develop a big picture of different audience needs, um, as well as different different ways the sectors do approach evaluation. And um, uh, what else did I have? I think one thing I suppose also goes to Brad's point around the the challenge of getting work, but then but then you're sort of tapped on the shoulder or you get work that sort of falls in your lap through maybe networking. And I think that there is such a value in networking and not in sort of a, a way that is um, sort of sleazy or over the top or because I know that term is sort of a bit strange, but but I think developing networks and really helps you learn from others about what they're doing and what the challenges have been but also can really connect you to people that you might see again five years down the track and there might be a job going with them and because you sort of and get that they know your background or they've seen work that you've done, it can be really valuable in, uh, in your career, I think. I see you nodding there, Ruth. Is it? Yeah, I was just gonna say, I totally agree. And if I could offer one very practical suggestion, um, when you look at evaluation jobs, be open in your searching for different roles. So like often I've seen lots and lots and lots of position descriptions, which to me is I'm like, oh, that's evaluation, but it's called an audit officer or a program manager or a, you know, <laughs> I've, I've seen so many different role titles for what could be an evaluation position, what looks like one. Um, so I know that's a very practical suggestion, but, but um, when you're searching for jobs, sometimes there can be lots and lots of more out there, but they're just not called evaluation. So, so try and be um, targeted and open to, to different role names as well. And on the flip side, look out for the jobs that are advertised as evaluation that aren't really. <laughs> All right, we're well, um, happy to take any questions from participants or uh, listeners. Uh, I'm sure there's things that have sprung to mind in the dis fairly broad ranging discussion about um, the stories from a few different people. And there may be sectors that haven't been represented today that uh, we should maybe reflect on a little bit. But are there any, any questions from the floor? Feel free to unmute yourself and ask the panel. Or well, the chat box, we can. Do that yeah, as well. the chat, there's a chat box as well. We don't have any questions coming through yet, but feel free to, to, to share any questions. Um, and in the meantime, uh, Leanne, did you have any uh, comments about opportunities or um, areas that evaluators can develop their practice? I mean, is it, I suppose this is a comment from me, but a lot of uh, young evaluators or new evaluators go to Clear Horizon as a great place to learn um, the basics of evaluation and be engaged in a whole range of projects and then on to other things um, in some cases. Uh, is yeah, there any reflections on that pathway? We, we, try not, we try not to think of it as a retention problem and think of it as we've grown some people and now they're going to go out and do good work wherever they land. Um, um, but I think, uh, I, I think a really good opportunity and uh, I can't remember who mentioned it at the beginning, but um, secondments are great, I think, um, because... Yeah, especially if you haven't had much experience, for example, in a program, managing a program, um, or being inside of government, but you're you know sitting on the outside consulting to government on on evaluations, um, it's good to have some of that experience. So, you know, we've had um, you know people at Clear Horizon, um, you know, from from obviously not not at a, at a junior level, but at a, at a senior or even principal level, um, being seconded into you know uh, Vigo or DHHS um, to do particular things for particular you know, bounded things for a period of time. Um, and that's a really good, um, I think, mix of opportunity to think about there. Yep. Excellent. So no, oh, here's a, a question from Aaron. I'd like to keep the door open between sociology, critical social science in the academy and work as an evaluator of social services. Is this a thing? So the door between sociology, critical social science in academia and work as an evaluator of social services. Totally, but one day, one side or the other is gonna just suck you right in. <laughs> but you can start that way, sure. Any other questions? 
Here we go. So from France, um, how do we get a foot in the door? I've done part-time, mostly voluntary eval for five plus years and have really have really broad experience, but not very deep. I've applied at government, not-for-profits, big and small consultancies, um, and I'm at a loss to know how to get a foot in the door. So how do you get that first start in evaluation? It's a good question. Any panelists have any ideas? Oh, apologies if I was one of the presenters here, but um, um, sometimes it's yeah because it, because it's the funding space is very volatile. I think it is sometimes luck. Like I, you know, I'd always encourage people to send their CVs around, but sometimes it's just not the right time to have someone on because you haven't got the work. And um, yeah, that that's a tough one because it's. I think I've been lucky a few times. I think when I first started at Centre for Program Evaluation, I was finishing up with Patricia Rogers at RMIT, and there was someone who was retiring, Neil Day, at the Centre for Program Evaluation. This is around two thousand five or six, and um, yeah, it was just walk walk out one door and in the other. But that was just pure luck, you know, um, luck. And plus, I'd done a lot of hard work for the guy who set up the Centre for Program Evaluation, so. You know, I was a shoe in for the job, but um, yeah, it was just timing. And I think if yeah, if you're approaching people, um, so I think you're doing all the right things. And I hope something happens and for you soon. Yeah, I, it's a it's a tough field to break into, particularly in in Australia. If you, it, it's that networking and relationships we talked about earlier. But I would say if you can, if you have a good relationship with any of them, um, have them take a frank look at your CV and just say, what's the balance that's needed to push me over the edge or be a better candidate? So maybe you've got a really strong statistics background and they say, well, we, we just need to see a bit more evidence of stakeholder engagement. And so in your next volunteering, have, have a focused volunteering experience where you're trying to get stakeholder engagement, you know, or, or, or statistics or whatever is, is missing um, to balance out a bit more. That would be my suggestion. Um, you're welcome to flick me your CV and I can look at it and be brutal, make you cry at night and tell you what you should have in it. Um, more than happy to do that. But um, yeah, I think sometimes um, you don't get enough feedback, particularly with government or larger not-for-profits. Um, you just get told, oh, that, you know, we didn't quite have the budget to hire lots of people. Thank you very much. So if you're doing volunteer experience and if you're doing all that networking and you're meeting with a person a fortnight and having a coffee with them, then I would say um, see how see where you can upskill to bring more balance to your CV. Um, and good luck. It's not easy. It took me like six months to get my first gig here. And it, it's just, it was a painful six months. So anyway. Mm, I think it's important to contextualize it within the economy in general. So the way I read it, most um, graduates don't get a job in their field that they've trained in for over five years you know so so it's not just us it's it's just how things are going and I, and I'm really surprised that a lot of people are having to volunteer you know and they before or intern they call it before they get you know paid positions so some of that just has to do with where things are broadly you know um, but the other thing I guess I'd say too is you know um, France, I know you're doing this now, right? Like you're, you're, you're doing a consultancy right now. So your foot is in the door. You are through the door, in fact. And, you know, so just keep on doing it. Keep on working. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, I think that um, in delivering this evaluation 101 training through the um, AES, so many people just find themselves falling in sideways into evaluation, a, a field that they didn't really know existed until they were doing it. So maybe that maybe a tip there is um, work in an area related to evaluation or somewhat in that area and then try to move sideways. So within government, there's always a huge amount of job shifting and the secondments and filling roles sort of sideways and in other departments and other areas. So I guess part of getting the foot in the door is getting the foot in the door somewhere near evaluation or somewhere in that area where you can then transfer your skills to an area that you're more interested in. So it's a little bit of a longer road, but probably one worth thinking about. Ruth? Yeah, I was just, I was going to add on to what you're, you commented, Charlie. Like I've had a few periods of time where um, projects finish up, so the job's gone. <laughs> so what are you going to do next? And of course, networking is, is so important. Being the right place in the right time, as Brad said, really, really important and understanding the economy. Um, 
what I've also found works is figuring out what people really don't like doing in the evaluation cycle and offering one skills. So I had a period of time where I just keep doing systematic literature reviews, just literature review after literature review because no one wanted to do that. So that was fine. So that's what I was doing for a little while um, or, you know, transcription and all that kind of, I mean, that was earlier. But, yeah, figuring out, and I'm sure you, you've done this, but figuring out what people don't like to do and then kind of developing an expertise and then suddenly people say, oh, this person keeps doing this thing. We all have to do it. So let's keep asking them to do all this work. And then eventually the other uh, uh, things will align. The market will be better. You'll be in the right place at the right time and a job will come and you're ready for it. But um, that might be something else to consider. Excellent. Ellie, you've, um, did you have a comment on that? Build off what you were saying, Charlie, I think it's a good point to look at other areas, for example, research positions in government or in a not-for-profit agency, often those things can lead to uh, evaluation roles or if you have some experience in uh, project management or policy, again, government um, is, a, is a good place to look for that and then you could often easily transfer over to an evaluation unit. It's really easy to transfer even across departments. Um, I know government, it, it can be quite competitive uh, through the, uh, the formal application processes. There are a range of different kind of recruitment firms that recruit through gov government. I think um, Hayes and Hudson and maybe a few others. And that can be a way to get your foot in the door. I think they offer small contracts like three month contracts or six month con contracts. But once you have your foot in the door, and are able to show you your skills, often um, a lot of opportunities can come up that way. Um, yeah, yeah. And I think the other thing around volunteering, it is it is something that uh, as, as the younger generation is required, which is un unfortunate in some ways, because it is quite a challenge financially, but uh, being maybe strategic about the particular areas, which I'm sure you're probably doing, but the particular organizations that you do volunteer in, um, to see maybe whether there are opportunities that might come up for employment. And sometimes that's not in the NGOs because they are limited funding. That's what I found anyway. Um, but yeah, that, that's just a few ideas. Right, well, we are coming to the close of the session. I do have two, two important announcements. First one is there's a, the AES is running a group mentoring pilot where they will link link you up with a with a senior evaluator, uh, I think a research fellow of the AES, and they're doing group mentoring. So groups of I think five or six mentees, and having someone that you can speak to regularly, facilitated through the AES. So if you're an AES um, member, um, it's possibly open just um, to members, but there is a, a mentoring pilot that you can be part of. Um, the it'll be inf information will be on the website and the application closes on the 22nd of November. So there's a few more days left to apply for the first tranche. I think it's um, worth noting too, Charlie, the, the mentors are super experienced, super high caliber, like really amazing um, people they've got lined up for that mentoring program. Yep, excellent. And thanks for sharing the link there, Brad. Um, the second thing is just to um, acknowledge that Leanne Maloney, who's uh, been the Victorian Regional Convener for a fairly long time, is um, stepping down from that role and moving into state, so therefore can't sit on the Victorian Committee anymore, but just like to thank her on behalf of the Victorian Committee for, I think, 10 or 12 years of service to the committee, and almost half of that, I believe, maybe longer, as the uh, Victorian Regional Convener. So thanks, Leanne, for all your work, putting together the, the seminar program and leading the whole Victorian operation. You've done a great job. It's been awesome working with you. And um, yeah, good job. Thanks, Charlie. You snuck that one in. It's a good time too to announce who the incoming regional convener is, um, which um, Bill will be put, put forward to the board to approve um, this weekend, which is Eleanor Williams. And she's currently um, the COVID evaluation director at DHHS um, and has been at DHHS for the HHS for a while and set up um, the, um, the evaluation unit there, which has grown over time, um, which is really instrumental in and very active in setting up the Victorian public sector evaluators network and the Australian public sector uh, evaluators network. So um, you're in super good hands. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> We're very lucky, very lucky in Victoria. 
Um, so thanks everyone for dialing in. We're going to stay on the line. If anyone's keen to just continue the dialogue or um, just social networking, whatever it might be, unstructured time, um, hang about and um, we'll end the year as we would normally do face-to-face -face with a bit of a catch up and, and drink. If some people want to go into breakout sessions, we can facilitate that as well. So just uh, let me know. But Thanks everyone for coming along to today's session and um, thank you very much to the panellists for contributing your time, ideas and, and thoughts and, and journeys as evaluators. Much appreciated.